Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jonathan Lister, Vice President, North American Sales for Marketing Solutions at LinkedIn. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. Welcome. So my name is Jonathan Lister. I'm the Vice President of Marketing Solutions for North America for LinkedIn. Again, welcome. Thank you for coming. We know how valuable your time is. We appreciate you coming out to Tech Connect 12. Uh, first, I'm, I'm looking around the audience uh, at the risk of offending any of the professional mustaches in the audience. <laughs> I'm an amateur mustache. I'm part participating in Movember, for those of you who know about Movember. <laughs> brethren, I'm guessing, brethren. I see a few amateur mustaches out there. So, uh, for me, this is amateur, this is uh, coming off in 30, Five hours and 15 minutes. But anyway, welcome. Thank you for coming. I felt I had to explain that because I have to talk through it all the time. Uh, Tech Connect 12. So uh, welcome. This is our event, LinkedIn's event, to bring together marketers and agencies to talk about trends in tech, opportunities in tech marketing, and really look at the tech buying cycle and what's happening in, in tech as influenced by social media that we think is really important. A couple of things we've seen that we think are really critical. Overall, we just see the complexity of buying cycles in tech increasing, partly driven by the influence of social media and professional networking. We see, the bu we see buyers changing. We see the integration of buying into other functions in organizations. So for example, we see marketers making key buying decisions for technology now. What influence does that have on people who are selling tech products and selling into the tech function? We see the power of individuals in general increasing as driven by social media. And of course, we see the marketing funnel changing dramatically to this buyer decision journey. And part of today's agenda is to help influence you and help us talk about ideas on engaging, engaging those people all through the tech buying decision and through the consumer buying decision journey. So lots to talk about. We have a great lineup of people talking. I'll introduce them in a moment. Before I do that, if you are interested in tweeting, if you're interested in commenting, we have a hashtag, I believe it's hashtag NTC12, so hashtag INTC12. Uh, we have a, I think our handle is in ads online. I oh, get that backwards, who knows that? Ads on LinkedIn. Ads on LinkedIn. At ads on LinkedIn, really easy to remember. <laughs> okay, so, um, one other thing I'll mention though, this will be, I'd like to make this interactive. Normally I say relax and enjoy, lean back and enjoy. This time I'm gonna say please lean forward and participate as much as possible. I'd like to keep this active. You will learn more, we will collectively learn more. So uh, do that uh, and I think we'll all have a great time. So uh, our panel, to, our, our lineup of, of people and presenters today is great. Of course we've got Clay Shirky who will keynote us. I'll introduce him in a moment. After Clay, we've got Kim, Celest Kim Celestra from Forrester and Michael Weir from LinkedIn, who will talk about a piece of research that we've done all about changes in the buying decision journey and the, the, the buying decision cycle in tech. Uh, it's a piece of research that LinkedIn's commissioned, that LinkedIn's done with Forrester, so we'll talk about that. After that, you'll hear from David Hahn, who's the head of monetization product at LinkedIn, and Mira Badia, who's the head of marketing solutions product at LinkedIn, and they'll talk about some themes in the product roadmap at LinkedIn for 2013. After that, we have a panel, and we'll conclude with a panel, comprising uh, IBM, Dell, uh, Marketo, we'll hear from uh, social media marketers uh, of those companies in a, in a panel at the end. And after that, we've got a chance to mingle, we've got a cocktail reception afterwards, and that will conclude the, the day's events. So let me introduce, at this point, Clay Shirky. For many of you, Clay needs no introduction. Clay's a prolific thinker, writer on digital, social media, uh, how these things are impacting professional life, social life. He's an NYU professor, he's a, a regular at TED, and uh, we're thrilled to have him. We've had him at LinkedIn before. Uh, on a personal note, I am a, a huge fan of Clay's. If you haven't read an article that, uh, or in a blog post that Clay wrote uh, a few years ago called Newspapers Thinking the Unthinkable, you should give that a read. I think it's one of the best overviews of what's happened to the newspaper industry and how an industry is prepared as that industry was still decimated by uh, digital and by, by, um, by digital media and by the internet. So I am thrilled to welcome Clay. Uh, please help me in bringing him on stage. 
Play Turkey. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Yeah, what I want to talk about today is social media and the way that that's changed how people come together, find each other, collaborate, uh, get things done. And this is changing the business landscape, not because it's about business, but because it's about everything. Right? It's about any place that people come together in groups. So rather than talk about that in the abstract, I'll just start with a story that I think illustrates uh, how dramatically some of this stuff has changed. And the story starts here. Uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration, the people who brought us, among other things, the early research on what became the internet, uh, decided a couple of years ago that they wanted to experiment with how people collaborate. They wanted to see how people collaborate, in particular under conditions of great information uncertainty. So they put up 10 helium-filled red weather balloons around the country, tethered near the ground. Every weather balloon was visible from a roadway or a walkway, but no one had this map except DARPA. And what they said was, in the next 30 days, if you can tell us where all 10 of these balloons are, using any techniques you like, we'll give you $40,000. That's the challenge. 30 days, 10 balloons, $40,000. So a team from MIT heard about this. They said, oh, we know how to take on that problem. And we'll just pay people, right? Everyone is, every balloon has been seen by someone. So we'll say, if you have seen a red balloon and you tell us where it is, and we win the prize, we'll cut you in on the prize money. So now they've solved the information disclosure problem. Now they have a marketing problem. Because they have to launch a national ad campaign with a target audience of 10 people. Right? <laughs> so can't do this on television too expensive. You can't do it on billboards too slow. You can't do it on newspapers too distributed. How do they do it? They say, well, we'll pay you if you tell us where a balloon is. We'll also pay you if you introduce us to the person who tells us where a balloon is, and we'll pay you if you introduce us to a person who introduces us to a person who tells us where a balloon is. And all of a sudden, there's an incentive for this message to spread because it's low cost to say, hey, if anybody's seen a red weather balloon, let me know, right? And the chance of hitting pay dirt is very low, but so is the cost very low. And so these messages then spread through Twitter and Facebook and mailing lists and all the rest of it. So there's three important things about this strategy. The first is that the MIT team won. And here they are holding their comically large winner's check. Uh, the second important thing about the MIT team is that they were the only team to correctly identify, here are the top 10 teams, the only team to correctly identify all 10 balloons. But the third important thing about the MIT team was the time. DARPA allotted 30 days for this challenge to unfold, and the MIT team solved the problem in nine hours. DARPA over-provisioned the amount of time it might take to solve this problem by a factor of 80. Right? That's when things change. It's not when technology makes hard problems easy. It's when it makes impossible problems trivial. Right? This isn't just new tools for doing the things we're used to doing the old way. This actually allows us to rethink the kinds of problems that we face whenever we're dealing with information flowing through a group. This is the media environment that I grew up in. This is the media environment many of you grew up in. A handful of large organizations could send messages, identical copies of any one message, to disaggregated people at the edges of a network. This is how audiences were assembled. This is how it worked whether you owned a printing press or a broadcast tower. This is how it worked whether you were in the business of making books or music or movies. The internet changes that. Right? The first obvious way it changed it is it makes those lines two-way, right? Now people can talk back to the media outlets. But that's not where the freakouts are coming from. The freakouts are coming from here. The freakouts are coming from the fact that any two people connected to the network can now speak to one another directly, no professionals anywhere in sight, and they can do it in very large groups. Right? There are way more green lines than red lines, and that's not that's not anything about technology. That's not anything about sociology. That's just math. That's just how networks work. What we're used to in the media environment is a world in which highly managed message senders then get to assemble these audiences. Right? That is, again, that's the media environment of the 20th century. What we've got now is this much looser, much frothier collection of any to any and many to many messages which can start from any place in the network and go to any place in the network. And the people here right, are not operating 
in the traditional model of management. Right? In a managed media environment, the logic is filter, then publish. Decide whether or not a message is worth the expense. Should we give the author an advance for this book? Should we green light this movie? Should we record this album? And then you publish it. Right? Out here, out in the network, the logic is publish, then filter. Let anybody say anything, and then sort the signal from the noise after the fact. It's that logic that the search engine business, among many others, is built on. And that change means that we don't just have a new way to reach the audience. It means that the idea of the audience as it was previously constituted is breaking down. We have to rethink everything that involves thinking about what the audience is and means and does. So here's a picture of the audience. This is a picture of people watching the Super Bowl. But it's a picture of people watching the Super Bowl from a sitcom. This is television's conception of what watching television is like. Right. Here's a picture of actual people watching the actual Super Bowl. Right? The difference, fairly plain. Right? It is no longer people just focused on the media. They are focused on the media and one another simultaneously in this big, sloppy mess. And figuring out the new kinds of communication strategies, but also the new sources of value in that kind of network is one of the big business challenges for grappling with social media. There are some good effects of this, and there are some bad effects of this. Uh, a few years ago, CVS, the uh, drugstore chain, decided that they were going to get in the business of selling a disposable camera. It's 30 bucks for the camera. You'd take it away. You'd record about an hour of video. You'd bring it back. They'd give you a DVD, and they'd take the camera back. Now, of course, the camera wasn't really a disposable $30 video camera. No one could make such a thing. It was a reusable video camera. And the idea was only CVS would be able to get your video off the camera and onto a DVD. So you'd always have to bring it back. They'd be able to wipe the drive and resell it. I'll ask you to join me in not being surprised that this happened instead. Hackers pried the back of it off. They said, hey, look at this. These pinouts over here with that orange ribbon. If you want to get the video off your camera, here's how you do it. Right? And thanks to the miracle of search, once that problem was solved once for anybody, it was solved for everybody, everywhere, all the time. So the, the upside for CVS is that these cameras started flying off the shelves. <laughs> the downside was that very few of them flew back. And CVS said to themselves, ah, we have a marketing and communications problem, right? The users don't understand how they're supposed to use these devices. So I know what let's do. Let's educate the users, right? And that's a really important phrase, educate the users. Uh, if you're in a meeting where that, that, uh, where that phrase is used, write down the time, because that marks the exact moment in the meeting when people ran out of ideas. And it turns out, in fact, that the users did not want to be educated to the idea that they bought something that they didn't own, that they, they could walk out of the store having paid their money for something they couldn't use the way they wanted. Right. And so the whole thing collapsed. CVS's experiment with the disposable video camera simply, simply failed. But that wasn't the end of the story, because there was one other company involved. And that was a company called Pure Digital. They were the ones that made the underlying hardware. And Pure Digital did not regard this as a Marcom failure. They regarded it as an R&D success. They said, what would happen if we treated the users as legitimate sources of information? What would we do? Maybe we'd sell them a one-button video camera. And thus was the flip camera born. Right? It was a response to the same information CVS got. What the pure digital people figured out was they were actually seeing unmet demand, not a Marcom failure. And that is one of the big changes between the old audience-focused model of a public media network and a network with social media. In the 20th century, there were essentially two modes of communication between a company and the audience. If I'm, if I'm a company and you're the customers, right, I can talk and you can shut up, and we call that advertising. Or you can talk and I can shut up, and we call that research. But there was no real model for, how about you talk, and then I talk, and we listen to each other. That idea of a conversational channel simply didn't happen. Right? And we can see from examples like this that in this environment, if you start to treat the users not just as people to be convinced to do things with advertising, but actually as people who have 
legitimate access to information that might affect the nature of your business, right? New kinds of things are possible besides regarding all of this as just a marketing and communications challenge. So what does this mean for business strategy? One of the curious things about that world where people watching the Super Bowl are also talking to each other in all of these mediated ways at the same time is that the human element is reintroducing itself into the media environment. Right? That in the 20th century, the model of media was we produce and you consume. Right? It, was, it, it was essentially enforced by the underlying media we had. Now we've got a world where people can produce, consume, and share. We still like to consume, of course. People will always sit around and watch or listen to or read interesting things. But then we want to talk about it with people, and we want to share it, and we want to modify it, and we want to use the things we see, not just consume them. And so this idea of changing media strategy, of thinking about ways in which people can actively be engaged, not just as people who might buy things, eyeballs connected to wallets, but as people who might actually be engaged with the messages and with other people who are using, caring about the same products and services. So here is a famous e-commerce site selling a famous book. Uh, and what I want to call your attention to is not either the e-commerce site or the book, but the number of customer reviews, 6,021 customer reviews. Now, you might think that some kind of consensus about Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone would have settled in after two or 3,000 reviews. But no, 6,021 customer reviews. And here is the 6,021st customer review. Full of creativity, you can read it very quickly. It's no surprise, it's been a bestseller. This is the only review this person has ever done. Right? This, is, this is not a book review. Right? This is not someone saying, hey, there's this book, J.K. Rowling, you ought to check it out. Right? There's, there's nothing like a traditional book review in this format. What this person is really doing is coming in and saying, Harry Potter, woohoo! Right? And Amazon is letting this happen. Right? Amazon is providing the platform, even though there's no way in which this is directly tied to any commercial advantage for them. A clue to why they're doing this is also on this page. I'm going to call your attention to the date. It's posted this morning. Another one may have been posted between the time I took this screenshot and now. This book was published last century, and somebody reviewed it this morning. Right? <laughs> So what Amazon understands is that on top of any commercial, any transactional logic that can be bolted down to the idea of we have books and people buy them, there is this additional residue of people caring about books and wanting to say something about it in public. Right? And one strategy would be, well, you know, they've got, they've got email for that, they've got Twitter for that, they can say this stuff any place they like, right? But that's not Amazon's strategy. Amazon says if we give them a place to tell one another how much they love this book, it won't be good for business in any kind of directly transactional way. This person has already bought the book and no one is going to buy the book based on the 6,021st recommendation. Oh, what a, yeah, it was one of 6,020. It, it was really that last one that tipped it for me. <laughs> It's not happening, right? But what is happening here is that there's a platform for human engagement that allows Amazon to have an audience that's more than just an aggregate of potential transactions. So one of the mysteries in the social media environment is that at the same time as we're getting all of these tools for allowing all of this kind of person-to-person -person connectivity, we're also getting the social science that tells us something about the commercial environment and how it isn't as nakedly and rationally transactional as we were led to believe by typical models of neoclassical economics, where everyone is just maximizing value on completely personal calculations. And in fact, an increasing amount of science says that it's almost impossible to squeeze the human element out of even relatively simple transactions. So this is a slide from uh, a, a study by Yuri Nisi and Alfredo Rusticini called A Fine is a Price. And Nisi and Rusticini set out to test two things. They set out to, they set out to ask themselves, right, 
what will happen right, if we attach a fine, a punishment, to behavior that people are engaged in? Right? We believe that they'll do less of that thing. Straightforward, simple, commonsensical, also relatively untested. And we believe that if we remove a punishment from something that people are doing, that they'll do more of it. Right? Again, simple, straightforward, but largely untested. So they set out to test these two ideas. Uh, and they did them in uh, 10 Israeli daycare centers. They studied 10 Israeli daycare centers, uh, group, grouped into two groups, one marked there in white, the other marked in black. And they observed these daycare centers at the moment of highest tension, which is pickup time. Because at pickup time, the teachers who have been with your kids all day <laughs> would like you to be there to get your little darlings. And you, you're at work, you maybe got a little late on the highway, running some errands, whatever, you'd like a little slack to pick your kid up, kids up late. So Nisi and Rustachini said, how many times in the average week is there a late pickup? And the answer was between half a dozen and a dozen instances of late pickups across these, uh, in, in each of these 10 daycare centers. So then they went to the daycare centers marked there in black, and they said, okay, we're changing this deal as of right now. Right. Although it doesn't, we're, we're rewriting the contract, which didn't previously specify anything about pickup time. Now we're going to say, if you pick your kid up more than 10 minutes late, 10 shekels added to your bill. No ifs, ands, or buts. Right. And the minute, the minute they added that fine, the behavior at those daycare centers changed. Late pickups went up every week <laughs> for the next five weeks until they topped out at triple the pre-fine average and then bounce around it between double and triple the pre-fine average for the remainder of the 12-week experiment. Right? You could see immediately what happened. Money broke the culture. Right? The idea was if something wasn't specified in the contract, then it wasn't specified at all. This is the neoclassical model. We're all rational actors. We all understand what's in the fine print. And we all adjust our behaviors accordingly. But in fact, out here in the real world, even though it wasn't specified in the contract, the parents and teachers had clearly come to some kind of understood bargain, negotiated on human channels, not contractual channels, about how often it was OK or not OK to pick your kid up late. And once the contract was changed to specify this 10 shekel thing, it communicated to the parents, this is a fee-for-service transaction. You don't need to worry about feeling guilty. right? You've paid your 10 shekels. To which the parents, quite reasonably, said, 10 shekels to pick my kid up late. What could be bad? <laughs> so they run this experiment for 12 weeks. And then they say, OK, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Uh, as you were, we're changing back to the old contract. And then a really amazing thing happened. Nothing changed. The culture that got broken stayed broken which is to say this isn't a light switch, this business of trying to engage with people in a human channel. Right? There's something organic here about people's relationships with one another that can't be specified in a contract, and it can't be turned on and off quickly. Right? And, and that, that sense of what is it that people are negotiating with one another, what is it they expect of one another, outside of the contractual, outside of the transactional, that's something that social media is, is making manifest, both because it's showing us that that was already there, but it's also providing platforms for companies that get this to take more advantage of it than they did previously. So back to Amazon and our friend with the 6,021st review. What Amazon is saying is it will cost us something to provide a space for people to review the same book over and over and over for a dozen years. But the cost of that is minor compared to the ability to build a platform that people commit to and that they're willing to share on. Even if we can't say, what's the ROI of this particular post? Right? Even if you can't drill down to, well, I want to see this action tied into those kinds of credit card transactions. Amazon has said there is this second thing, this culture of sharing and conversation that creates business value for us. It creates customer loyalty. It creates word of mouth. Uh, but it doesn't create transactions. And if Amazon only thought of itself as being in the transaction business, they would never have done this. 
Now, it's easy to say, right, this is fan culture. These are people who love books and have a lot of time on their hands. Uh, what about the world of serious business, not business to consumer, business to business, right? That's where the contracts really are completely specified. That's where people get along in the kind of hierarchical management that these systems uh, have departed from. But increasingly, even that is turning out not to be true. Ron Burt, as a sociologist at the University of Chicago, wrote a great, uh, a great paper some years ago called The Social Origin of Good Ideas. And he went inside a company, completely contained inside the firewall, no, no consumers involved. And he, at, at a moment of senior management changeover, he convinced the incoming management to field a bunch of ideas for making the company work better, for looking at ideas that might be interesting or profitable or valuable. And he got them to rank those ideas in order of their quality. And what they found, when they put employees on a graph, not an org chart, but a social graph, and each number isn't uh, a counter, it's just the ID of the employee because they didn't want to use their real names. What they found is that the employees who were at the highest risk of having good ideas, as Bert put it, because he was using uh, an epidemiological model for having good ideas. The employees at the highest risk of having good ideas were the employees that had the most bridging contacts. Good ideas weren't coming from engineers. They weren't coming from designers. They were coming from engineers who knew designers. They were coming from designers who knew engineers. Right? What the org chart does, par excellence, is it separates divisions. And then everybody who goes in and draws those dotted lines on in crayon after the fact recognizes that if you just structure people that way, you lose this. But what Bert found, similar to what Amazon has found, is that person-to-person -person communication in ways that are neither specified nor structured by the business unit itself are nevertheless a source of tremendous value. And Bert called this feature bridging structural holes. He said, you have to have a world in which engineers mostly talk to engineers and designers mostly talk to designers, or you wouldn't get any work done. But you have to have some people whose position inside the social network, whose position inside the social graph, is about moving information laterally across those groups. They are bridging the structural holes between departments. And finding those people and, and figuring out how they can create value is a critical source of business value, but it's one that can't be specified by contract. Because again, as with the Amazon stuff, this is something that's about people negotiating with one another. I'm, I'm friends with the people I'm friends with. I talk to the people I talk to. And yet, the ability of these people who bridge structural holes means that if you, can, if you can see into or understand the social network, you, you have access to this kind of value in a way that you wouldn't if you were just treating them either as an audience or as a hierarchy. So the business design issue here around communication, around media, is really about balancing these two forces, right? You have to have some kind of organized, this person is that person's boss, these are the marching orders, this is what we do, culture in your company. But you also have to have some sense that the human relations, that the culture of the company, as employees deal with one another, as employees deal with clients, as employees deal with vendors, as employees deal with customers, has some additional value over and above what's specified in the contract or readable on the invoice. Right? And that is a radically different design model for thinking through how to create value. And there are degrees to which different companies can take advantage of it. Not everybody can be Amazon, obviously. But the companies that are experimenting most dramatically with that kind of value are often the ones that end up looking the most different from their competitive peers. So this is a site called Patients Like Me that does this. Patients Like Me is a business to business company. They sell data to pharmaceutical companies. Their goal is to aggregate enough people who suffer from a particular disease or syndrome 
so that they can understand something better about that cohort. And this is a, this is a tremendous problem in the pharmaceutical industry, right? Finding enough people, particularly for rare or debilitating conditions like ALS, uh, finding enough people to actually get into a numerically meaningful drug trial is hugely time consuming and hugely expensive. And very often the cohort that's assembled is so small that even, even then you don't get a lot of value out. So patients like me is in the business of aggregating that data and offering it to people who are working on drug discovery, which is a multi-billion dollar problem. So how do they do it? They get people to come in and, and report. This is what I've been diagnosed with. This is what I've been prescribed. This is the dosage I'm taking. These are my side effects. This incredible act of self-reporting, right? So this here, top 10 dosages uh, for gabapentin. Right? This histogram uses more data points than the pharmaceutical companies themselves can often easily get because they've got so many people now coming in and reporting this. This isn't just this is the drug I'm taking, but these are the dosages I'm taking it at. And so you start to be able to see into what, the, what doctors' practices are because of what patients are reporting. You get all of this in charts and graphs, broken down, uh, actionable, granular data, tremendously valuable. But that's not all that's on the patients like me side. Uh, there's, there's this intake form, which is, how are you feeling now? Patients are also reporting their, their conditions and their reactions. There's much more of this kind of self-reported data here, again, than the pharmaceutical companies can access. Now, the pharmaceutical companies are in the business of making and testing these drugs. What is it that the patients have access to that the pharmaceutical companies don't have access to? And the answer is the patients have access to reality. Right? We're, we're the ones who are sick. Right? We're the ones taking the drugs. We're the ones who know how we feel. Right? And there is simply no way, no matter how wealthy and how sophisticated of pharmaceutical companies, there is simply no way to model reality inside their firewall. Right? That what the actual customers, what the actual users of a product or service are trying to do right, is so complicated that you can only mock up the barest hint of what that looks like inside a company. Right? This isn't just true of drugs. This is true of anybody that sells technology. Right? Anybody who, who's ever said, well, the manual says this, but when I try and make this piece of software work on that computer over this network to talk to that server, suddenly the complexity multiplies. And you have to go outside the firewall to get, to get that kind of access to reality. Patients like me also supports bulletin boards. So the patients go in and talk to one another. This is the, as you can see, I think at the top, the venti vent vent thread. You can imagine what goes on in the venti vent vent thread. Uh, the venti vent vent thread was started uh, on April 11th of 2008, and it is just a place for people to vent. Uh, the most recent posts in the venti vent vent thread were this morning, again. And between now and the time I took this screenshot, someone else has probably posted to the venti vent vent thread. So five consecutive, well four and a half now, consecutive years of venting by the users of patients like me. So it's easy from a business-to-business per business perspective to see how to make this site better. Let, let's get more of that gabapentin stuff and less of the venting, please. Right? But that's not actually going to work. Because when you look at what the individual patient profiles look like, you see here is a patient who's going by the pseudonym of Badzi. Uh, she's listed a lot of information about herself. She suffers from fibromyalgia. She's got 16 more conditions. There are many multi-syndromic patients. There are tons and tons of reported data. She's also got almost 4,000 posts in the forum. And over 1,000 times, other users have said she's been helpful. Because what the venti vent vent thread and all of the other threads on the forum and all of the other user-to-user -user interactions do is it gives people a way to get something they don't often get from the medical system, which is, I'm sorry you're feeling bad. Right? Just a kind of sympathy, somebody else listening. Right? The average 
encounter with a doctor in this country is 12 minutes long. But people who have chronic or acute conditions live with that stuff all day long, every day. And so by providing patients like this with the forums, they're actually providing a way for those people to create value for one another, value that does not show up in data you could sell to the pharmaceutical companies. But they're not collecting data about gabapentin despite the existence of the venti-vent-vent -vent thread. They're collecting data about gabapentin because of the existence of the venti-vent-vent -vent thread. That the users are committing to the site mostly because they're committing to one another. Right? And this has enabled patients like me to engineer nothing less than an enormous cultural shift in the user's attitudes towards medical privacy. Right? They don't give their names, but as you can see, you could probably reverse engineer some of this stuff right? if you know enough about someone's gender and locale and syndromes and so forth. Everything about the American medical system says don't tell anyone your diagnosis, don't tell them your medicines, don't tell them your symptoms. And what patients like me are saying is, if we talk about it, we'll actually be able to accelerate the degree to which we can get better together, to which we can, we can help the medical system help us. Right? And that, that change, realizing that it's not serious, hard-edged business value over here and squishy human stuff over there, but that these things can be combined in the Israeli daycare centers, that on Amazon, that on patients like me, serious calculations of business value and a platform for humans to express the stuff that can't be expressed in contracts can actually go together because we now have a medium that allows both of those kind of communications to exist side by side. And when you see the amount of data that these patients are producing, in part because they are committed to one another, you see how dramatic a change this is. So let me end with one last point. This is something called the Horowitz Triangle after Bradley Horowitz, uh, uh, first of, of Yahoo, now of Google, who's worked a lot on social software and was the first person to articulate it in this way. What Horowitz said was, when you give people an opportunity to participate, when you treat them not as the audience, but as people who might potentially engage, about 1% of the people you make that offer to will dive in. They will say, oh, I've been waiting for this. I know how to play this game. I will, I will write something. I will annotate something. I will do something. And about 10 times that many people will say, oh, I see what's going on. I'm happy to play along. I'll respond. I'll vote. I'll comment. I'm not going to be the person who pushes this thing along. But, but if, if the ride is already going, I'll get on. And about 10 times that number will just watch, will be lurkers, will say, I'm interested in this, I'm following this, I'm reading the venti-vent -vent thread, but I'm not myself venting. And there's obviously a lot of movement here in both directions, right? People can go from being lurkers to being sort of side participants to being core drivers and so forth. There are some people who always jump in. There are some people who always lurk. These are not personality types, they're behaviors. But this is one of the things that points to the end of the audience as we know it or knew it, which is to say, when you want to engage a group of people, it's no longer about having a message that blankets the whole group, and you hope that a handful of those messages land in the right place. Now, very often, it's about saying, if I want to get to a group of people, and I want to talk to them, I want to engage them, I can't do it directly. I can't do it as effectively directly as if I find the people who are going to create the social glue, if I find the people who are central to the network, if I find the people who are bridging the structural holes, and I send my message to them, and they then take that message and do something with it that creates value for the other people in the network. Right? The, old, the old models of marketing worked incredibly well in a network where broadcast tools were the tools that anybody could get their hands on. It's tempting to say, that the new models are just those tools now on a packet switch network, right? That, that Facebook is the new brochure, or that Twitter is essentially a, a, a kind of is a PR newswire by another means. But in fact, the underlying structural difference between the audience-oriented uh, environment and this environment 
is that you're now not dealing with disconnected individuals. You're now dealing with a network of people who know each other. They know each other better than you know them, and they're often much more willing to listen to their own peers than they are willing to listen to you. Amazon got itself out of the business of recommending books from the stance of the professional critic, recognizing, in fact, that the platform of user-to-user -user value was ultimately better than putting themselves in the position of the expert. And that, that sensibility, that understanding that we're dealing now not just with new tools, but with new problems that we can take on in new ways, is core to grappling with the change in social media. And there I'll end. Thank you very much. And I think we have time for a couple questions. I think we have time for a couple questions if there are any. I think we have time for a couple questions if there are any. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, sure. So the, 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 the question is, is to cultural differences. Um, one of my favorites is that uh, on English language Wikipedia, people will edit arguments and then get into edit wars and then go to the talk pages and hash it out. In Japan, they'll go to the talk pages and figure out what they're going to do first, and then they'll do the edit. So right, there are, there are a lot of these changes. There are, there, are, um, there, are, there are more argumentative environments. There are more collaborative environments. There are, there are uh, environments where there's, there's a lot more noise. There's environments where there's a lot more quiet. Uh, then there are, of course, technical differences. Right? If, you're, if you're dealing with sub-Saharan Africa, very often SMS is the principal messaging channel, not so it's, it's not the sort of smartphone as containing the, you know, the top third of the web the way, uh, the, way the iPhone does, but actually uh, lots more back and forth messages and then platforms for, for using those. Uh, there's no, I think there's no blanket advice there except to say cultural sensitivity to both, both of those things, both the kinds of cultural expectations about how much argumentation, how much engagement you should, you should or could expect or uh, try to provoke, and uh, sensitivity to the nature of the platform, how much of it's likely to be web traffic, SMS traffic, and so forth. In as much as you're operating in, in uh, circumstances outside the US, those are, uh, those are essential. Uh, the one thing I will say, however, for all that everybody loves the sort of don't pat the tie on the head kind of stuff, um, that as, uh, as the technological infrastructure rises towards high wireless bandwidth on your person, um, behaviors have tended to converge. And it's an open question as to whether they'll eventually converge on a single point or they're simply becoming more similar. Uh, but for years, uh, for instance, the Koreans maintained that as a Confucian culture, the young people were never going to be disrespectful of their elders, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, a few years ago, they had this huge protest that nearly toppled the government, run effectively by teenagers. Um, and more recently, the Moon, the new, uh, the new president of Seoul, uh, was brought in place in part because of a social media get out the vote campaign. So for all that there are cultural differences, it's also important, I think, not to imagine that these differences are absolutely essentialist. And uh, people in, in, in Kenya are fundamentally different kinds of people than people in Norway. Um, there, are, there are traces of those behaviors. I mean, there are you know, obviously some differences in behaviors. But it's also possible to go too far on believing these people are fundamentally different than those people. Um, and, and in particular, uh, as, again, as people move towards high, high wireless bandwidth, the behaviors are more similar than they are uh, when, when the tools are more disconnected and variable. Yeah, okay. I was just wondering if you could look to the future mm -hmm. in terms of as businesses start to adapt this model, like Amazon and patients mm -hmm. like me, mm -hmm. what is the next iteration of the like, mm -hmm. iteration? Where are we headed? So one of the iterations, so I, 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 I'm predicting the future is a mugs game, by and large. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's way better, I think, to look around at what's already existing and, and imagine that that is the big deal rather than saying, oh, you're flying cars, any day now. So um, rather than say, here's the flying car of, of the next 18 months, I'll say the two things that I'm paying most attention to are GitHub and Quora. Uh, GitHub is the programmer's distributed tool for working on open source software, but it is a general purpose tool for sharing structured text. And people are starting to use it to annotate all kinds of things, like legal documents. 
And you can imagine it not just for lawyers, but for consultants, for accountants, for really anybody where a group of people needs to collaborate around a document. So GitHub is just, it still, it still looks and feels pretty geeky. It's by geeks for geeks, but it, it has a collaborative pattern that is very engaged. And then Quora, this business of the world being the only place where you can get access to reality, Quora, the question answering service, and there are several other services like this, provide a structured way of saying, if we get the network right, then good questions will get good answers. And it's not sort of Wikipedia, when was the Crimean War kind of answers, it's why did Pointcast fail? Someone, you know, someone asking a kind of historical business question, but getting essentially uh, business school level sort of case study analysis of this is what happened, these are the advantages, these are the disadvantages. And that ability to aggregate collective intelligence, and both of these are both GitHub and, and Quora ways of uh, aggregating collective intelligence, but they're both, uh, they're both pretty extraordinary and they're both standalone right now. And what I'm, I'm betting is that those kinds of features get drawn into the business landscape um, either a company at a time or a sector at a time as people start to realize the value of those, those tools. Oh, yes, sir. The examples you gave, the folks that created the network were also reaping the reward. And we're mm -hmm. seeing a lot of now integration across those networks, like even the Facebook likes on Amazon. And how do you see that trend evolving and do you see situations where the value is reaped in a place that isn't where it's created? This, yeah, this is the huge open question, right? It's the platform question right now, which is I make a platform, Twitter is right now the canonical example, right? I make a, I make a platform, there's an easy to understand tool for making an API, building a client, uh, everything's going great guns, and then people in the mothership say, you know what? At a certain point, there's a there's there's an ancillary value to this network that we are going to carve out and defend for ourselves. And the trick there is, the temptation early on in any platform is just let a thousand flowers bloom. But then, if you have to go in with a lawnmower and run over 500 of those flowers, it suddenly can make people really really upset, as it did when Twitter started killing off the clients. So the the the. The trick, the, the, company, the company that I've seen manage this best uh, was Delicious, the original tagging service. And Joshua, uh, Joshua said, the, the CEO of Delicious said essentially, you own your data, right? Here are the APIs, you can get your data, you can get it down in this clean XML format. We don't know anything about you that you can't have uh, and walk away with clean and delete. But only we own the aggregate data which is to say all of the value in assessing stocks and flows, trends, ebbs, spikes, all of that stuff, that resides in the mothership. And Joshua understood the dynamics of, uh, of that network, uh, where, where Delicious was going to go, that they were able to articulate that bargain with the users and the third parties in advance. Very often, however, it's this messy business of offering things, seeing what works, and then breaking some things. And uh, it would be great if everybody could say in advance, right, we know, we know what the value proposition will be, but it's not, it's not happening. Um, it's not happening that way. And again, Twitter, Twitter is the canonical example. So the one thing I would say for any company wrestling with this is, A, don't build a business where if one business unit in a third party makes one decision about the API, you're done. Right? And many people have built those businesses, Twitter clients, people spidering on Amazon, all the rest of it. Um, you have to find some source of value other than a single, you know, a wrapper around a single uh, other kind of business. And two, if you yourself are offering platform services, um, you want to be as clear with people about your future intentions, even if you haven't made the decisions yet, about the future possibilities of what you might decide um, to, avoid the, to avoid the PR backlash if indeed you go and break something later. But it's, I wish there was a better answer than that. It's, it's, it's always going to be a hard problem because platform value is always this combination of what am I going to share to grow the network as a whole and what am I going to defend because it's core to the business proposition. And when you discover what you're going to defend after the fact, you often end up, you often end up breaking things. So. Yes, ma'am. With for B2B and social, and you look at patients like me, how did that outcome of the value 
was that the value they were aiming for in the beginning, or did it organically evolve to it, that? Some, some of it organically evolved, but the, but, the, but the initial intuition was that they could create the cultural change that would make patients think of themselves as participating in the medical system rather than just being uh, recipients of it, as it were. Um, and that, in fact, if you go on the patients like me, in addition to their privacy policy, which every, everybody has, they also have a link in the same place called their openness philosophy, which is essentially their argument about, uh, their argument about the value of aggregate sharing. What I think did grow organically and what has, what has surprised them, but also I think, I think pleased them, are things like the vent event thread or the post here if you need to exercise but you haste to do it thread, which is another thread that's lasted five or six years with relatively frequent, uh, relatively frequent updates. That that kind of person to person value, um, it can be planned for but it can't be built. It's almost like buying a trellis. The vine still has to grow. You can, you can build something the vine can grow on, but you can't predict the ultimate shape. And that, that piece, uh, that piece was organic. I think if you'd gone to the founders and said, you know, name me the top 10 list of threads you think will appear in the forum, it probably would have been things around symptoms and medications. And in fact, it's, it's all of this kind of social glue, but that social glue is keeping people like the woman you saw up there on the site and she is both a producer of data herself, but also one of those yellow triangle lead users that, that makes an inviting environment for everybody else. So it's, it's as, as with anything with social media, it's a mix of, of, of planning, but not over, not over planning to the point where if the users don't behave the way you expect them to, you know, then, then your model's broken. You've got to give them space to, to surprise you as well.